Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the author of The Glass Castle, Jeanette Walls. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome to the Smith Rafael Film Center. Thank you. It's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful film. And uh, of course, coming from just a, a lovely, lovely book. So thank you for um, sharing your story with all of us. And, thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, appropriate to say that on the stage in the last few years was Woody Harrelson and Brie oh, Larson. Yeah. So we're rounding out the whole uh, yeah. creative cast here. Yeah. So thank you again for coming. Um, I was just wondering because you know you uh, so courageous and talented when you when you wrote this book and it was published in in, in two thousand and five and 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 all the surrounding elements to get you to that point and now here we are twelve years later and it's uh, uh, it's a movie and it's an adaptation mm -hmm. and it's such a personal emotional mm -hmm. complicated story, beautiful story, but you really had to let it go for yeah. this adaptation. W was that difficult for you? Well, you know, it was, uh, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you all so very much. It's really, it's a joy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's such an honor. Um, you know, when I sat down to tell my story, I, I didn't think anybody would get it. I thought it was just too weird and too creepy. And, and the degree to which anybody read it, I would be held in contempt and ridicule. I did not expect it to hit. And, and I was ashamed of my past. And now this past that I was so ashamed of is a movie that I'm so proud of. And um, I, yeah, it was hard letting go. I, 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 it was really, I tried a couple of times to write my story when I was younger. And... Um, I just throw a couple hundred pages. I'd write a couple hundred pages and throw it away. And it was my mother saying, "Just tell the truth," that made me sit down and, and try to tell it. And um, I, I never thought it would get made into a movie. Somebody said, "This must be a dream come true for you." I would have to be insane to dream that an Academy Award-winning actress would play me in a major motion picture, and that Woody Harrelson would be my dad. I'd have to be insane. But, but so like, as soon as the book came out, it got optioned, and I was like, "Great, great!" And people said, "Well, we're going to have to Hollywoodize it." I said, "Do whatever you want, as long as it gets made into a movie." And then a couple of people worked on scripts, and they were kind of, ah. Uh, maybe I don't want anything done. You know, I, it was sort of like, I was so eager for it to be made into a movie, then, you know, I don't want my parents to be a punchline. At least not, not somebody else's punchline. And, and, and so it was sort of like, I just, I, I got sort of kind of proprietary about it, but plus everybody was saying, we cannot turn this book into a movie. It's just too complex. We've got to Hollywoodize it. And it just went through a bunch of producers and a bunch of screenwriters. And then about five years ago, this amazing man named Gil Netter, a producer got his hands on it. And this is a man who will not take no for an answer. And he did so many brilliant things, but the most brilliant thing he did was to hire the director, Destin Daniel Cretton, who made what I now call the second best movie ever, which was a short term 12. And it was about foster care system. And I, I watched it and was just flabbergasted by how he managed to make a movie that was filled with joy and pain and despair and redemption. And I thought, if you know, this is the man. And my older sister was kind of ambivalent about the idea of it getting turned into a movie. And she watched Short Term 12, she called up my mother and she said, our story is in good hands. And at that point, I kind of let it go. I'm not a movie maker, I'm not a script writer. It was the perfect relationship where I trusted this man. I got into a couple of arguments with him he always won because he was always right. As soon as he explained his reason, he was like, oh, you're right. They contacted me constantly about ch changes that they wanted to make to the book, going off the script, collapsing a few scenes, expanding a few scenes. It was always in consultation with me. So I just felt very safe with him. I'm wondering how many people have read the book? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I, I think... Uh, the greatest books that were made into great movies have always never been literal mm. translation, of, well, so to speak. Some very good books get yeah. made into not very good movies and vice versa. Yeah, and, you know, I, I didn't know what was going to happen with this. And um, I spent a lot of time on the set. And, and so I had some idea that they weren't going to mangle it. Um, but 
and, and I saw the script, and it was, uh, the actors as well would, would contact me constantly, or, or the, pe the uh, people who were, they were playing. And there was a, an incredible passion about authenticity. They just wanted, you know, uh, what do you think was going on here? We're thinking of doing this. How, does, how would you feel about this? So um, I, I trusted them. And at the same time, the book is so complicated, they had to leave something out. And a number of the uh, screenwriters who looked at it previously focused on other things. But Destin, who was not only the director, he was one of the screenwriters, he immediately seized on the relationship between the father and the daughter. He felt that was the heart of the book and carved away a lot of other things. And he told me about his decisions. I want to do this scene. I want to do this scene. He had to let some of them fall by the way, by wayside. They filmed over an hour, you know, the, the final, well, not the final, but a, a, a rough cut was three hours long, so we had to delete certain scenes. And when he told me he was deleting one of the scenes, oh, Destin, that's the best scene ever. How could, how could you cut that? Out? You know, and he explained to me his reasoning, and I realized, oh, he's right. He's right. Well, if they took every great uh, chapter from the book, it would have been like five hours. Well, it's a possibility. But <laughs> uh, but the other really difficult mm -hmm. thing, and, I, and I, I'm sure many in the audience have heard me say this before, but for me, the most important thing of, of a film is that whatever the character or characters are, that they resonate in an empathetic and in a universal way. Exactly. And in exactly. your book, you balanced and were so non-judgmental, the good and the bad mm -hmm. on this, and mm -hmm. it became relatable. I'm mm -hmm. sure people must stop you all the time and tell you that, whether they, they it wasn't the same story, obviously, and right. uh, but that there were things that were really they found universal. And this movie does that as well. Well, that makes me overjoyed to, to hear that you feel that way, because to me, that's why we tell our stories. You know, um, it, we're not exhibitionists. We're not out there looking to try to get pity or to get glory. We're just saying, you know, this is my life, and maybe you can learn something from it without the nasty business of going through it. And maybe if we're lucky, we can connect on some sort of emotional level. You know, you will recognize something of yourself in my story. And then these bonds are created, and it's kind of magical. Because after having told my story, you know, I, I talk sometimes on behalf of it, and afterwards I'm signing, and there'll be somebody standing in line, and she's all Neiman marcus out, and I think, you know, oh, oh, some rich person and she has nothing in common with me, she'll come and say, girlfriend, you and I could be sisters. And she'll say, you know, my daddy was a truck driver, my mom was a cocktail waitress, and one day daddy went out for cigarettes and didn't come back. You know, and said, and you're looking at 12 perfect carrots here. And, and it's, it's kind of magical, because, you know, until I told my story, I would have thought, we have nothing in common. But the number of people who've come up to me and said, the details of our lives are very different, but you and I have something in common. And then they start telling me things about themselves. And it's this incredible gift that people feel safe with me. And that's the magic of storytelling. And I believe this movie does that as well. It's just like, you know, people have come to me who haven't read the book and said, you know, my father was an alcoholic. I've never told anybody this before. And that's kind of spectacular. Because I think that sometimes we we think we're protecting ourselves, we erect these barriers, we think we're protecting ourselves, but all we do is isolate ourselves. And, and through storytelling, we take down the barriers and we make these connections by what we have in common. And we learn from one another. Yeah, and if you could spare five minutes for me later. <laughs> um, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't ask about uh, the process that you went through with these incredible cast members. Oh, oh. And I mean, there's like, there's there's three Jeanettes and there's <laughs> three Laurie's and yeah, three yeah. And et cetera. But yeah. uh, just starting with, uh, with Brie and yourself, oh, what, Brie what was that like? I mean, it, 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 I've, I've heard her say that, you know, it's, it's such a blessing to have this main subject available, but it's also a great responsibility. Well, you know, how did you, what was the process like? And that's why I love and admire her. She understood it was it was a, that I was a resource, but it was also a responsibility. And every one of those actors was just so sensitive about not violating anybody's humanity or dignity. They were never interested in making us into characters. They would they really were interested in getting in deep. And I I was prepared, and I'll completely I'll come clean on this. I thought that Hollywood would be kind of shallow and superficial, and all these people and shut me up because they they blew me away with their emotional intelligence and their sensitivity about about character they, they weren't looking to make fun of anybody who is this person and they keenly understood the light and the dark and Brie uh, introduced herself by writing a magnificent letter to me about you know that if you know asking if she could turn to me um 
wondering, you know, if there's anything that is that she didn't that I didn't want her to do. They were just so sensitive to this sort of thing. I was blown away. You know, I talked to her a couple of times. It was sort of funny because she said, "Do you have any tells?" And I, I didn't know what a tell is, and she said, "Do you have any you know physical habits?" I, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and um, she and and. Um, the other actors, they all got to, the, the, all the, the three Jeanettes, as we call them, they all d started doing this to create some continuity. And I'm watching her on the set one day, and, and she stands up and throws her purse over her shoulder and starts walking away. I was like, huh, that's kind of funny the way she does that. Oh, oh, I guess I do that too. So this woman, she picked up on things that I don't know about myself. She listened to all these tapes of me, and she said, you have five different ways of saying like. And she knew the circumstances under which I said like in, in five different ways. She said, you slip into a West Virginia accent when you make fun of yourself. I got a tin ear. I don't hear this stuff. But it was like being analyzed by this incredibly wise and sensitive and perceptive person. These actors, these good actors, and everybody on the set was a good actor, but they've got extra nerve endings. And they just see things and feel things that, you know, flinty gals like me just, I, I don't pick up on these things. So it was humbling as an author who likes to think of myself as perceptive. Receptive. Wow, wow. They were smart. And uh, Ella Anderson as the middle me, how about her? Was that amazing? Oh my gosh. I, I, and I, I talked to her about how did you know? How could a 10 or 11 year old know all of these things? And it's kind of weird and beautiful and mystical because Ella Anderson was born on the month and year that The Glass Castle was published. So we're both kind of convinced that some hand of fate reached in and delayed the, the, the filming of the book until she be, was old enough to star as me. So, you know, it was, I, I just thought that, that that performance, but it wasn't just her. I mean, even, and I hate to say the bit parts because there, there is no such thing as a bit part. Everybody was amazing. Little Chandler Head was, she was amazing as well. And these kids were all running around the set and they were all redheaded and they were all running around Montreal and everybody thought it was this weird family of redheads, you know? <laughs> but they bonded and, and that was part of the whole process. These kids all went to an Expos game together. They went to the park together. Naomi Watts was fabulous. She treated them all like her children and they felt kind of safe. And the astonishing set director, she made this old shack of, recreating 93 Little Hobart Street. And she said, it was run down, it was, it was sort of ratty, but your mother was an artist and it was also beautiful. She, she, um, she visited my mother's house, cottage in Virginia and took pictures. And she said she noticed my mother's, she's a hoarder, which I didn't know when I was growing up because our houses were always burning down. Um, but now that she's actually lived in one place for a long time, it's all it's filled up with junk. And one time I was trying to clean out, you know, mom, you can't keep all this junk. And I'm throwing it out like, oh, this piece is actually kind of nice. But, but, um, Artists are often like that. They find everything beautiful and they, they keep these things. And Sharon Seymour, who did the set, immediately picked up on her. And, and so did Destin. They just loved mom. And so they went to great lengths to, to treat her with sensitivity. And they both pointed out that an artist, a male artist who ignored his children would not be judged quite as harshly as mom was. And they just, they both loved her and got her. Um, and, um, they just they, they they created this house, this ninety three little Hobart Street, um, and like I said, it was kind of a shack. But all the kids love living there, and a couple of them said, "I want to live here forever." You know, they just it was very much like a family, and the kids felt safe, and and that's one of the ways that Destin got these astonishing performances out of them. You know, is that they felt like a family. So uh, did Na Naomi had some time to uh, spend with your mom? Yes, yeah, she did. You know, my mom originally. Um, she wasn't going to cooperate with the movie um, because um, I think she was afraid that she was going to be the villain of it. And um, when Destin came to Virginia, where I live now, he saw these, uh, he opened up one of mom's sheds and there's about 500 paintings there. And he was he had planned on, you know, having her paintings recreated, but he decided why recreate them if the real thing is here. So those were mom's paintings in, in the movie. And um, at first mom wasn't going to lend them to him. And she's like, no, I don't want my, I don't want my paintings to upstage your story. You know, <laughs> and I, I knew that that was one of mom's reasons. You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a typical mom's explanation to not want to cooperate. So um, uh, she called up, so I said, you know, they're going to cast Naomi Watts as, as you, Mom. So she calls up my older sister, Lori. Who is this Naomi Watts character anyway? And Lori says, she's very beautiful and she's very talented. Suddenly, Mom's on board, you know? <laughs> and so Naomi Watts is calling Mom and they talk and, you know, um, 
And mom was going around telling all of her friends at the senior citizen center, yes, my actress has been speaking with me to perfect my voice. You know, she just, she was very much into it. And um, when she saw the trailer, I was a little bit nervous what she would think about it, but she was over the moon. She saw, she went, oh, that looks just like Rex. That looks just like one of our cars. And then she sees Naomi Watts, oh my gosh, she looks just like me. You know, so, <laughs> so mom is happy. <laughs> Well, she was beautiful. She is beautiful. She's and very talented and a very kind and decent human being. Shall we open it up for questions from the audience? See what they have to say and ask? Yes, right here. Thank you. Uh, the, the question is how my siblings are. I'm sorry. No. And was the David character all fictional? Um, my older sister is still living in Manhattan. She's still an artist. Um, my kid sister is... Um, Living on the West Coast, she's okay. She's okay, she's not great, but she's okay. My brother has retired from the police force, no longer the Gestapo, and he um, works for Habitat for Humanity. Um, he's great, he's the best. Um, the David character, um, Destin called me on a regular basis and discussed my previous marriage, and we expanded on that. It is not all fictional. It, it, it is very, there are, there's some tinkering, in a way that I, as a memoirist, might not have been entirely comfortable doing, but it is, it is very true to, to the, um, the essence of my first marriage, yes, yes. The, the question is, uh, there was a lot of forgiveness, and was there any sort of spiritual practice I engage in? Well, first of all, thank you. Secondly, I, 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 I do appreciate the concept of forgiveness, but I don't think that's quite the right word for, in my case. It's, it's not forgiveness, it's acceptance. If you say forgiveness, that, that casts me as a victim and I, I just don't see it that way. How do you forgive somebody for being damaged? My father is an alcoholic and my mom's loopy. She can't take care of herself. How could she take care of me and for me to say, I forgive you for being weird? You know, it's, it's just like, this is who she is and I believe she gave me great gifts. People are free to disagree as some of my siblings do. I choose, and it's a choice and I choose to focus on the good. My brother says that one of the big differences between me and him is that if there's a train crash, I would focus on, he would focus on the, the fatalities and I would focus on the survivors. And both are accurate, but neither is completely true. And so that's one of the challenges we have in telling the truth is, is to look at the whole big picture and not just focus on what we are inclined to focus on. So far as spirituality, I'm, I consider myself to be a very spiritual person, but my therapy, such as it was, was telling my story. And that is what all therapy is. When you go to the therapist, they, they get your story in, and they force you to be honest about it. And so the first version I wrote of The Glass Castle, which I wrote in six weeks, was very bad because I did not go deep enough. I'd, I'd written it as though it happened to somebody else. You know, I, I had heretofore not considered the plethora of influences. And my agent read it and she said, you wrote this as though it happened to somebody else. You have to describe how it affected you. It didn't affect me at all. I'm perfectly normal. Nothing bothered me at all. And, and, and the truth is when I read it back the first time, I was kind of shocked. And so my therapy was just going back and really trying to be honest about these things. What really happened? How did I really feel about it? And it's, there's something that really magical that happens in storytelling. A very wise man once said to me, secrets are a little bit like vampires. They suck the life out of you, but they can exist only in the darkness. Once they're exposed to light, there's a moment of horror, but then poof, they lose their power over you. And I found that to be very true. It's a, these things that happened to me that I thought made me less of a person. You put it down on paper and confront it, it's just something you went through. It shapes you, but it doesn't control you. And, and I thought I'd completely come to terms with it, but then I watched the movie and I watched the filming of the movie. And there were a couple of points at which when I was on set, I just, I lost it. So I obviously have not completely come to terms with things. I, the first time I saw Woody Harrelson in character, I just, I was trembling and I was shaking. I, I did not expect him to, you know, I thought, Woody Harrelson, of course he's going to be good. He's Woody Harrelson. We all love Woody. How could you not like him? I was not prepared for that. He blew me away because um, I talked to him a number of times about dad. It was funny. I was I was all prepared to have these sort of ornate descriptions of my father's motivations. And on the Briggs-Meyer test, he would probably be, you know, type whatever. Blah, blah, blah. And, and, and Woody asked me, he said, did he look you in the eye when he talked to you? And what did he do with his hands? And they just wanted this physical stuff because they so intensely understand the relationship between the physical and the emotional. 
But, you know, I, he was working really hard at it. He had a tape on it. I thought he'd get him pretty good. And then the first time I saw him, I was like, oh, oh my God, oh, my God. And he, he, he nailed it. And I first the first take they did, it was on script. And then they went off script. And Woody was saying things that my father had said that I had not told Woody about. That was how purely he understood it. And Destin told me on a number of occasions, you know, it, it, he would say, I don't think Rex would do it that way. I think he'd do this. And, you know, so they, they all of these actors were really into the character. And it, and it just, it, with this great sensitivity, bordering on reverence without ever whitewashing, they just wanted to get it right. And I thought they did. Yeah, I think they did too. Don't you? Uh, any questions uh, from the back here? Yes, right over here. Did my siblings agree with how I remembered my childhood? They do not dispute a single fact. Well, there's one thing that my sister said would happen to Battle Mountain that I put in Blythe. But they, other than that, they do not dispute a single fact. Their perception is very different. One of the things that I like to tell is that my very favorite memory for my entire childhood was when dad gave me a star for, well, it was, turned out to be a planet for Christmas. I, to this day, when I see Venus up in the sky, I think, that is mine, honey, I own that. I just, I love that gift so much. I love that story so much, I told it at my father's funeral. After I finished telling that story, my sister, Lori, cr folds her arms and said, isn't that like that sorry SOB dad of ours to go give away something that doesn't belong to him in the first place? <laughs> and I thought about that comment a whole lot while I was writing my story because Lori's absolutely right. Dad's giving me Venus was a completely meaningless gesture. But I'm right, too. It was a priceless treasure. So in telling our stories, even though it's nonfiction, we shape our truths by which stories we tell and how we choose to tell them. So I could have made mom and dad a lot worse. I could have made them a lot better. And it's a choice that we make, not only in writing our stories, but in living our life. What do we choose to focus on? Is our life a tragedy or a comedy? It all depends on how you choose to tell it. And when I when I saw that scene, yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. It was it kind of represented the complexity of your dad, you know. Too, I I that. completely agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions here? Um, is there over there? Yes. There was some truth to it. You know, that came from conversations with Destin, where you know, I was. People would ask me about that sort of thing, and I just sort of said, I, my first husband, well, I've got to be kind of careful in this, but my first husband actively encouraged me to lie about my past. I, but that was my fault. I was the one who prompted him, and he, he kind of encouraged it. Um, and then I was just out at dinner one time, and I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I did not then run out of the restaurant to my father, but, it, but it was, that, was, that was a liberty that he took. But it, there was, there was a, an episode in which, you know, I just, I don't, I really like the people, I'm sitting there lying, and I just, I got tired of lying. On the other hand, I was, I noticed in your book, there was a dedication, it says, to John for convincing me that everyone who is interesting has a past. Yeah, that's my second husband. <laughs> I got it right the second time. My second husband, um, my first husband, you know, again, I'm, I'm not blaming anybody, it was my choice, it was my decision. But he just, he, he was a decent man. He was the anti-Rex. I married somebody who would never make me write a bad check, who would never you know, take the rent money to buy beer. Um, I, I trusted him. He never once hit me. I mean, how, what more could you ask for, right? And, and so, but my brother said, you're describing a good accountant, Jeanette. My, my second husband, he was really the person who pulled the book out of me. He admitted the first time I told him about my parents and my family, he thought I was exaggerating. And then he met my mom. And he said, oh, this is really complicated, but you must tell this story. Turned out well. Yeah, not bad. Additional <laughs> questions, yes. Uh, in the back. Did your, did your second husband change from How did I find the courage to tell my story? Um, part of it was mo mom challenging me or, or giving me permission to just tell the truth. I tried and tried and just couldn't do it. But it was my second husband who just said, you know, he, he contacted our agent. We share an agent. And, um, and he said, Jeanette's got an amazing story. He said, yeah, yeah, her and everybody else. You know, tell her to write it down. Um, and he got an advance. And I, 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 at one point, I said, I can't live with this being out. We've got to return the advance. This is just too embarrassing. He said, too late. We've already spent it, which was a lie. <laughs> but... Um, I, you know, it, he, he also forced me to be honest. He, he'd look at it and say, 
you know, you're not coming clean. You've got to, you know, what really happened here? And one of the many lessons I think I've learned is like, you know, we all have these things about our past that we don't love. And um, if anybody here is thinking of writing your own story, and you know, there's something that you cannot imagine putting down on paper on the computer because it's just too horrible and too awful, you must tell it because it's pivotal. It's pivotal, and and if you if you decide you want to write your story, you can always take it out. You can fictionalize it. But one of the things that I found out is we all have pieces of the puzzle floating around in our head, and we don't know what we know. The first time I wrote my read back my own story, I was a little shocked. I'm like, dang, I thought this was going to be a little lighter than it is, you know? And But then I kept on rewriting and rewriting, and it was, like I said, the most cathartic thing I've ever done. So if anybody's thinking of writing your story, I cannot recommend it highly enough, even if you choose not to share it with anybody. But it was also the most excruciating thing I've ever done. I spent five years just tortured about it. But, but I, I believe that the truth will set you free, but the truth, it's not easy to get at. You know, it's, it's challenging. And part of the big challenge is finding your voice. Uh, yes, over here. Was the title obvious? <laughs> Was the title obvious to me? I always thought I wanted to call it The Glass Castle. My publisher hated it. And I, I, I'm, I'm no good with titles. Some people have the title before they have the book. Um, and so I was thinking, you know, something about Venus, the gift of Venus or something like that. But it sounded sort of vaguely pornographic or something, you know. <laughs> and then I was like, demon hunting. Or, you know, but that, that sounded like some sort of vampire book or something. And I just couldn't think of anything good. So we went back to Glass Castle. Everybody hated it. But I, I kind of liked it. It's old-fashioned, but I'm an old-fashioned kind of person. We have time for one more question. Oh, okay, you're the loudest. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm working on another book. I I I don't have any idea whether it's any good or not. I, I hate writing, and I keep on saying I'm not going to do it anymore. It's horrible. I hate it. Why do I do this to myself? But it's like a disease you don't get rid of, you know. And it's like, and I think I'm going to be okay. And then the hand keeps on going just like typing on its own. So I'm working on another book. I'm, I'm banging the drum for this movie right now, obviously, but I, you know, it's just, I, I live in the sticks. I'm, I'm complete hillbilly. I return to being mountain goat again. <laughs> well, mountain goat, I was if I can be so bold to call you that. Uh, when does the film open? Uh, uh, August 11. August 11th. Mm -hmm. Well, just thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. In thank so you. many different ways. Thank you. Here with thank us Thank you tonight. so very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.